This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. In the future, the brightest empires will be born around dying stars. Colonizing other star systems in this galaxy is probably one of the most foundational topics we cover on this show, and a few weeks back we looked at colonizing red dwarfs, those smallest of stars which outnumber all the other types of stars combined. I mentioned at the time that even though they were the most numerous, they were far less bright, amounting to less than a percent of the current starlight in the Universe, and that they probably wouldn't have the most planets either. Both those honors belong to giant stars, and I thought we should follow up looking at colonizing dwarf stars by looking at colonizing giant ones too. As we will see today, such systems around giant stars may be crowded with dozens of planets, all potentially habitable, and each taking decades or even centuries to orbit their star. However, as I was writing that sequel I began feeling like it was a topic that needed to be broken into a few episodes instead. So this week is not just a sequel episode but also the first of three episodes, or second of four perhaps. In a couple weeks we will follow up with Killing Stars, where we will look at those giants so big they go supernova and if and how we can manage them or even colonizing them. Then after that we will go the opposite direction and ask about living without stars, colonizing the deep voids between them or even between galaxies, in exostellar civilizations. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and this will be a longer episode, so if you haven't already grabbed a drink and a snack, now's a great time to do so. Giant stars can cover a pretty big range of systems since the term itself has a bit of vagueness. We will be looking at all the types of giants today which are larger than our Sun, but too small to go supernova, saving those for the next installment of the series. The term dwarf and giant, when applied to stars, is essentially a relic term of when we could basically only see their color and make a loose guess as to their distance. All stars are white, but will have a peak spectrum associated with the surface temperature. If you know roughly how far a star is away, then by taking its apparent brightness to our eyes and instruments, you can calculate its actual brightness or luminosity. And from that, if you know its temperature or peak wavelength, you can determine its surface area and from that its radius. A star twice as hot as another, for instance, gives off 2 to the 4th more energy per unit of surface area, or 16 times as much, while an object 10 times further away will give off 10 squared, or 100 times less light. When plotting this data on a chart with peak wavelength on one axis and luminosity on the other, we started noticing they're mostly grouped into two fairly distinct categories, or sequences, and we named the physically big and very bright stars giants, and named the more numerous dimmer and smaller stars on the main sequence dwarfs, a word which is now synonymous with a star burning hydrogen during the first phase of its life. At the time we could disproportionately see the brighter stars, and we could not even see M-type red dwarf stars, which make up the majority of stars, and thus the dwarf and giant monocles made sense. Also at the time we often called them old and young stars, as we did not know about nuclear fusion yet and assumed that stars glowed brightly when they were young and cooled as they aged. This terminology has been dropped but stuck around as a relic for quite a while after we figured out fusion drove stars. Giants and dwarfs fit better but are still relics and don't work well, as it means that 99% of stars are labeled dwarfs, including our own sun. Of course it depends a lot on what we mean by bigger, and in this context I mean mass, but volume and brightness also work. The more massive a star is, the bigger and brighter it is, but the biggest stars are always those that have left the main sequence, stopped burning hydrogen and expanded to become red giants or even red supergiants. Stars get hotter, rather than colder, as they age, and eventually reach a phase called subgiant, then their red giant phase after that. The period a star spends in those latter two phases varies a lot but will generally be more than a percent but less than 10% of their main sequence period, so short but not so short we want to ignore those objects for colonization. Indeed stars the mass of our Sun might see those late periods last a full billion years, whereas a star just twice as massive as our Sun will barely live a billion years on the main sequence. Stars smaller than our Sun, which is the vast majority of them, will have even longer red giant phases, 
Though interestingly, since stars the mass of our Sun live 10 billion years before going red giant, and the Universe has only been forming stars for a few billion years longer than that, there are no red giants formed from stars 10% less massive than our Sun, and few even of our size. The Universe just isn't old enough for these to have come to exist yet. Yet red giants and subgiants are quite common, indeed they will generally be more common than stars twice as massive as our Sun simply because they are so short-lived. So our primary interest today will be to look at these three categories of stars. First, those two to eight times more massive than our own Sun, but not big enough to go supernova and which are also still in the main sequence, which are not proper giants under the nomenclature we explained earlier. Second, the subgiants, which are that range leaving the main sequence but not true giants yet and a fairly distinct category. Third, the red giants, those stars now born in helium. We will ignore the main sequence stellar classes of F, G, and K, G being our Sun and F being those a bit bigger, while K a bit smaller. Incidentally each stellar classification, like F, G, and K, also divides into 10 subtypes, 0 to 9, with 0 hottest and 9 coldest. Our Sun is a G2 Type 5 Sun, the 5 being in Roman numerals and thus folks often will incorrectly say V, and that indicates a star in the main sequence, or a star burning hydrogen in its core. I'm guilty of doing that myself, incidentally. I made note that B25 stars are the ones on the cusp of being able to go supernova, and thus for discussion in that future episode, and every time I look at it I mentally pronounce it as B2V. Bad habit, but also a common one even with astronomers in my experience. A 3 in Roman numerals indicates a giant, a 4 a subgiant. In the York's Luminosity class, 0, 1, and 2 are hypergiants and supergiants, and we will save those for another day. Today we will look at three example stars, Vega, Procyon, and Arcturus, the 5th, 8th, and 4th brightest stars in the night sky respectively and an example of a larger main sequence star, a subgiant, and a red giant, again respectively. Incidentally the brightest star, Sirius, is fairly similar to Vega but wasn't selected today as an example even though it's closer because it is a binary with a white dwarf companion. We will talk about binary systems today but I wanted to start with the single system examples. You can also see our Stellar Compendium episode for a deeper dive into star classification history. Vega is a Type A0 star, the hottest of A-type stars, and is 2.1 times more massive than our Sun, 2.4 times wider, and fully 40 times brighter. Vega is only 25 light years from Earth, making it pretty close as things go, and the reason why it's the fifth brightest star in our sky without being a giant of any type. It is also our closest example for today, but there are still over 100 star systems closer to us, and we will want to start by asking what Vega has going for it to appeal to would-be colonists, these future Vegans. Of course proximity is the top of that list and fame too, there are good odds all the named stars that are regularly and easily visible to the naked eye will be easier to find colonists for, and Vega again is the fifth brightest star and also used to be our North Star several thousand years ago and will be again in several thousand more. Incidentally Polaris, the current northernmost star, is a yellow supergiant five times more massive than our own Sun, or includes a yellow supergiant, it's a triple star system, and we'll return to it later today too. Vega is surprisingly low in metallicity, elements heavier than hydrogen or helium, for a star as young as it is. Usually the older a star is, the less metallicity it has, as the Universe had less of such elements early on, but that's only a general rule of thumb. A star's metallicity is mostly determined by the nearest supernova in whatever nebula it formed from, but as the Universe ages the overall metallicity rises. Vega is about half a billion years old, about a tenth our Sun's age, but is also about halfway through its life same as our Sun. It started to shine about the time life was crawling out of our oceans. While its metallicity is fairly low for a star so young, it does have a thick circumstellar disk of dust which results in excess emission of infrared light emitted from that dust after it absorbs sunlight, and indeed stars with this behavior are termed Vega-like stars. Other interesting notes, Vega was the first star besides our Sun ever photographed, and it also varies in brightness quite a lot, and rotates very rapidly, about twice a day compared to the monthly rotational rate of our Sun, though exact rotation velocity is hard to see because Vega not only is up near our celestial north pole, but also has its own polar axis pointing toward us. We're not sure what the cause of the dust ring is, but the most popular solution is that it's from a planetary collision. 
The inner boundary of the debris ring is fully 100 AU out, a hundred times further from Vega than Earth is from our Sun, so this is more like a Kuiper Belt than an Asteroid Belt, even accounting for Vega being brighter. We suspect Vega of having planets but it's basically at the worst possible angle to use for detection, showing us its poles not its equator, and while that is handy for detecting a big ring of dust around it, that is awful for planetary detection. This is where habitable zones come into play. Now the habitable zone of a star system, or Goldilocks Zone or CHZ, Circumstellar Habitable Zone, is hypothetically where a planet could be in terms of distance from its star and support life, but specifically is where we think a planet could be and have liquid water on its surface, and that's vague too, estimates vary from as little as just a few percent closer or further from the Sun than Earth is, to as much as ten times further out. Since today we are not contemplating stars with naturally evolved civilizations around them, a Vega for instance is not even a giant star yet, and still will only live around a billion years, we might as well be on the more generous side of habitable zones, planets we could as easily terraform to be Earth-like as Mars or Venus, without using solar mirrors or shades, in favor of manipulating the atmosphere's insulative traits and just adapting to a warmer or colder climate. We will keep it fairly round at half the distance to twice the distance from the Sun as Earth is, in terms of relative brightness anyway. A star twice the distance from our Sun only gets a quarter of the light, and one half the distance four times the light. Vega though gives off forty times the light our Sun does, and thus to get the light that Earth does a planet would need to be 6.33 AU away, further from Vega than Jupiter is from our Sun. If we are assuming our Sun's habitable zone was half an AU to two AU, then Vega's analog would be about 3 AU to 13 AU. That is an enormous range, and would still be big enough for multiple planets to be in it, if we picked a more constrained CHZ width of something like a tenth closer or further from its Sun, not double or half as we did. Incidentally the year length will vary a lot. In our system a planet twice as far from the Sun has a year of almost three Earth years, while a planet half as far from the Sun would have a year of only about four months. That would be the upper and lower lengths of years on the Goldilocks zone of our Sun for our picked length of a fourth to four times what Earth gets. Alternatively around Vega, the Earth-like year length is 11 Earth years long, and would vary from 4 years to 32 years on the inner and outer edge of Vega's Goldilocks zone. The more massive an object is, the more quickly things orbit at a given distance. But that period goes with the square root of mass, a star needs to be four times more massive than our Sun to make a planet orbit in half the time at the same distance, and a hundred times more massive to make it orbit in a tenth the time, again at the same distance. However luminosity of a star rises far faster, at somewhere between the cube and fourth power of mass, and brightness only falls off with the inverse square of distance, thus the brighter stars are, the longer the year length they will have for habitable planets. In many of our bigger examples, especially of red giants whose brightness rises even though their mass stays the same, habitable zone year lengths will rise to centuries or even millennia. Now that is important for a couple of reasons. First, such long years help emphasize why we can pack so many planets into these systems habitable zones, they have an enormous value of space, and slow orbits, so that planetary perturbation and module collisions should be relatively reduced. Add into that the shorter lifetimes for such perturbations and collisions to have occurred in, and you might get systems swimming with planets. Second, such long years make seasonal variation pretty extreme, and argues against habitable zones being quite that wide as we offered earlier, half to double. We can contemplate life forms able to survive cold hibernation of months, but centuries is another story and we formally begin our summer and winter seasons with the longest and shortest day of the year because it takes time for the planet's temperature to catch up to whatever the temperature should be for that increase or decrease in lighting, but it takes a month or two, and would on a planet around a brighter star too, even if that planet had a century between its solstices. Again it does not matter as much as it did when looking at red dwarfs or other yellow suns like ours because we are not talking about naturally occurring life. Vega is on the small side for main sequence giants for today's use of giant to include just stars two to eight times as massive as our own and still main sequence, but a star eight times more massive won't live about a billion years, it will live more like 50 million years, less time than it has been since the dinosaurs exited the stage, not even enough time for a planet to have finished coalescing and cooling to form a planet water could be on. So we're just not talking about natural life, only what we add, barring maybe the simplest microbes for the smaller stellar examples like Vega. 
On the far end, up around 8 solar masses, where stars begin ending their lives as supernova and only live tens of millions of years, we have plenty of examples because they are so easy to see far away, but they are rare. There's only Vega at the top of the A-type stars, and beyond then it goes into the B-type blue stars, and out of the over 10,000 stars within 100 light years of us, only a handful are B-type, Regulus, Algarab, Algol, and Alpharats, and none of those four are even four solar masses. Such stars, and those more massive yet, also tend to be multi-star systems more often than not, which can often have a big impact on habitable zones. Again, Polaris, the North Star, would be one such example, and with its three stars all nominally inside each other's habitable zones, it's difficult to imagine any stable planets around them. Two binaries in close orbit, which is common, just have a wider habitable zone for planets that orbit both, while those in distant orbits, also common enough, would have two separate habitable zones nowhere near each other. But those in the medium distance can have habitable zones overlapping or nearly touching, and you could get some weird examples where a planet orbiting one star would have been a bit too cold on its own just from that star, but was warmed enough by the other to be habitable and have a double seasonal cycle based on its normal year and axial tilt, and how often that other sun was nearer or further from it too. The rough border zone for stars to go supernova, and thus for discussion in our next episode on killing stars, is those that are a main sequence B2 stars. Just a bit smaller, the nearest B3s are Alpha Pavonis, also called Peacock, at 180 light years away, at 5.9 solar masses, and Alkia, the leftmost star in the Big Dipper, at 6.1 solar masses and just over 100 light years away, neither could go supernova at that mass. If you found an Earth-like planet, in terms of lighting, around Alpha Pavonis or Peacock, that planet would need to be orbiting 47 AU out, well beyond Pluto's distance and would orbit Peacock every 130 years. Such a planet would need a strong ozone layer from the sheer amount of ultraviolet light it would get from this star being three times hotter than our own, with a correspondingly blue shifted spectrum. Using our half and double distance habitable zone range, planets in it would orbit between 45 and 370 years. Values are a bit iffy here too, as we suspected of being a close binary. Should we colonize such systems, and if so, how? Well it's common to say no, given how short a time they live, and yet I think that's an example of how often we let our non-intuitive sense of astronomical scales of space and time interfere in our thinking. Some star might only live 50 million years, but that's still nearly a million times longer than you or I would live, and represents a couple million generations for humanity. We have only had a couple hundred generations of recorded history, and that's being generous given that you could barely fill a single book with all the recorded history of the first half of that. Humanity has been around a lot longer than that, but even a generous definition of human probably could only be stretched to a hundred thousand generations or so, and thus still only represents a few percent of the lifespans of these shorter-lived stars. Indeed, even the shortest lived stars, the genuine supergiants that go boom, live around as long as humanity has been around. Given that, it's hard to argue that it doesn't make sense to colonize these stars. Their planets might not be ideal for terraforming, numerous though they are likely to be, simply as they might not be done cooling, and there are likely to be a lot of protoplanets and dwarf stars still hanging around that haven't merged or been collected as moons yet too. However, such stars give off dozens or even thousands of times more light than our sun does, and likely will have far more available mass orbiting them to build stuff like megastructures, space habitats, and solar collectors out of. We build houses and call them old if they've been around a century. Spending decades building an O'Neill cylinder and knowing it will only be in service for 50 million years wouldn't seem like something that would stop folks from building one, especially given that it would seem unlikely they would last that long without far more maintenance invested into them than went into building them originally. Even outright artificial planet construction taking millennia, like shell wards, would still seem a very good investment. Such things are mobile too, if it comes down to it, though we will discuss evacuating plants in the follow-up episode Killing Stars. Now it is fairly common to start referring to stars in this mass range or higher as blue giants, even if they are main sequence, but the classification system that has the Roman numeral V or 5 as main sequence, the York's Luminosity classes, has 3 as normal giants and means something fairly specific for that, typically red giants like Arcturus, which we will get to in a moment, but between those we have the subgiants like Procyon, 
And here we have stars already on their way out of the main sequence, where it would seem less wise to invest in a colony. Procyon is just 11.5 light years away, one of the 53 star systems and 78 known stars, some being binary, within 5 parsecs or 16.3 light years that we designate as our neighboring stars and first colonial targets. 50 of those are red dwarfs, 11 are known brown dwarfs, and there are probably more, and these are also interesting colonial targets we will look at more in exostellar civilizations. 4 are white dwarfs, and only a dozen others are larger stars. Procyon is a star just leaving the main sequence and entering the subgiant phase, and it also has one of those white dwarf stars too, Procyon B, as a companion. However, the white dwarf is a distant companion with an orbital period of 41 years, and our Sun is 2,000 times brighter than Procyon B, so it would have no effect on planets close to Procyon A in terms of temperature. However, it is very eccentric and gets as close as 9 AU to its partner, so on a habitable planet around the primary it could be as close as 5 or 6 AU at times, and thus while it would seem 50,000 times dimmer than our Sun, it would still be several times brighter than our Moon. It also still has a lot of mass and would be very disruptive to planets in the habitable zone of Procyon A. It's also a dead remnant, and would have been the bigger of the pair beforehand, as it died first. We estimate it would have been 2.6 solar masses compared to Procyon A's 1.5, and we believe it left the main sequence about a billion years ago, with both stars being just under 2 billion years old. Procyon B is now doing the same and is about 7 times brighter than our Sun, whereas a main sequence star of its mass would generally be more like 4 times as bright. Though stars get brighter as they age and their cores begin to deplete of hydrogen, they still have a lot of hydrogen left as they get to the subgiant phase, but less of it so the core gets hotter as it begins to crunch down and increase the fusion rate. For such stars, this is not necessarily terminal for life living around them, but a planet that evolved life when that star was young will receive double or more light and solar wind hitting it to strip off atmospheres and so on. They are certainly colonizable, but you know the end is coming. However, this is a phase every star that can go red giant will go through, and it lasts a fraction of that star's lifetime, meaning for most of the stars that will go subgiant, this phase lasts longer than those B-type giants we were just discussing that only live tens of millions of years, so I would say yes, you would certainly colonize such a system, but I do not know that you would bother with terraforming its planets. You could of course keep terraformed plants around a subgiant or even a red giant, but as we often discuss on the show, plants are not the ideal method of making living space, so I tend to assume folks really determined to go to the effort of terraforming a planet would be more worried about the long term aspect, and even if such a terraformed planet might have tens of millions of years left before the red giant phase began, I suspect they might opt for another system, given that there's no shortage of them. And not even 1 in 10 stars is massive enough to be a subgiant yet, even if they formed the dawn of the galaxy, and most stars did not, stellar formation rates are fairly constant. For those less focused on plants, these systems make very nice targets for colonization, lots of light, plenty of room and raw material, and since most artificial habitats are essentially spaceships, if you built one sturdy enough it could last for 100 million years, you can just pick it up and move it when the subgiant and giant phases end, as well as moving it outward gradually as those stars brighten. Now let's get into the first true giants in classic astronomy, our red giants. Arcturus is a red giant 37 light years from us, of spectral type K0, which would actually make it an orange giant bordering on yellow giant, being right on the edge of the KNG stellar classes, but it gets called a red giant and I'm not sure if I've ever heard the term orange giant used. I mention that though because it means that Arcturus's light spectrum is pretty close to our own. Arcturus is old, around 7 billion years, and 8% more massive than our own sun, thus why it is already going red giant at only 7 billion years of age. It is currently 25 times wider and 170 times brighter than our sun. At only 10% more massive, we can mostly ignore orbital period changes, and simply note that Earth would need to be 13 AU from the star to get the same lighting, and that its habitable zone would basically be your Saturn through Uranus distances, with planets orbiting it having years of multiple decades to perhaps a century. Red giants are the end of life phase for stars over a quarter of a solar mass, though as I just mentioned, Arcturus is not actually red, however in the orange to yellow stellar classification and the biggest and brightest stars, those so massive as to go supernova, do expand too but are still so hot we start calling them yellow supergiant or blue supergiants, but we'll discuss supergiants next time. Can we colonize these red giant stars? Yes, certainly. Should we? 
Again, yes, certainly, and in many cases they will have habitable plants around them as they slowly warm up. Some longer lived red giants might have once frozen plants that slowly thawed and did so over a long enough timeline that native life could evolve there. They give off tons of light, making them nice candidates for Dyson swarms, and likely will have plenty of raw materials around them too. Our Sun might expand enough to get Mercury and Venus and maybe even Earth, but that's not the majority of raw material in the Solar System. Now, red giants are often thought of as the death throes of a star, but it should be noted this phase can last as long as a billion years. Indeed, longer on smaller stars, though again none have yet gone red giant, the universe is too young. A star's red giant phase is shorter than its main sequence phase, but it's still a very long period, and for most stars, their red giant phase will be longer than the lifetimes of stars like Regulus or even Vega. This is the period where they are burning helium rather than hydrogen, though that's way down in their core, and at this point that star is a big thin blob you could literally fly through. What we normally think of as the surface of our Sun, or any star, is just where the light comes from, and it's very thin even compared to air, not some solid you'd fall into and burn up in like we tend to picture with someone falling into a vat of molten metal. If it weren't for all the radiation burning you on the way down, you could fall very deep into a star. And this is even more true in a red giant. They are so spread out, you could literally run a spaceship through one without burning up, and doing this is a way to slow down their ship or turn it. Indeed, planets swallowed by expanding red giants would endure for centuries, continue to orbit that star, albeit as centaurs, while orbiting inside that star. What's truly interesting about these stars though is that they might be what we choose to colonize first, rushing to get out to them not because their time is almost up, but rather because they permit us to reach them first. These are common types of stars to find and decently evenly distributed, and if we're thinking of sectors of space a couple hundred light years across containing several thousand stars, odds are good you will have a couple of red giants in here and one of them will be ground zero for colony ships, and as such likely the local capital or spawning point for other colonies. Why is that? We've often talked about being able to boost ships up to very high speed using known technology by using laser propulsion systems. This means if you are willing to build up your space infrastructure enough to shine lasers on your ships as they leave their home system, they can be pushed up to as fast a speed as your ship's ability to detect and handle space debris would permit. There's no real limit on how fast you can go, and it lets you go much faster than a classic rocket would permit, be it chemical or fusion powered. But there is a problem, you need some way to slow down, and if you're approaching a new system, there is no laser braking system to do that yet. We contemplated some methods for doing that back in our episode X's Fleet, but crashing into a stall might work well too. In last week's episode on orbital bombardment I mentioned that one alternative to aero braking is what we call litho braking, which is where you slow a ship down by slamming it into rocks. Ramming a spaceship into a stall, especially at very high speeds, would seem even more crazy, but in truth it's not a bad way to do it. At those speeds the temperature of the star is essentially irrelevant, especially if your ship is shiny to reflect light away. Indeed there are large tracts of essentially empty interstellar space at higher temperature than a red giant surface. What matters is that it's a thick bit of gas, compared to interstellar space, but not too thick, so a ship might be able to pass through one's outer skin and get rid of a lot of speed essentially as much their current speed allowed them to drop while running the diameter of that stall at whatever acceleration rate they could bail. I wouldn't want to try to come down from near light speed this way, but even things moving at about 10% of light speed should be able to break down to a complete halt for just the cost of the heat shield using this method, though this is a very rapid deceleration and is probably better suited for something automated and unmanned. Other methods for breaking ships that we have looked at, see our episode Excess Fleet, would also work better on a red giant system than a normal star, such as those that focus on solar wind. Being very bright and emitting lots of solar wind, a vessel could begin slowing sooner out and faster with conventional light sails and braking using the solar wind than in other star systems, then plunge through the star to take off more speed. This also works well in tandem with sending some automated probe out just ahead of you into the solar system, which can break this way, undergoing higher g-forces then deploy as a stelazor to slow the mothership down. Even if the ship can't achieve total deceleration using one of these methods and has to use onboard fuel, it will be able to slow down from a higher speed than any twin ship relying on only that fuel. 
As a result, since it is very likely that systems will be colonized by ships approaching them as fast as their braking technique will safely allow, rather than as fast as we could make them move, then Red Giants would be the fastest stars to reach, and the first things colonized in any volume of space far from Earth. Red Giants produce anywhere from hundreds to thousands of times the light and energy that our Sun does, and will likely be the first reached and with all that available energy, are ideal for setting up huge laser pushing systems to slow more incoming ships or help turn them or send them on their way to other neighboring stars. They might be natural hubs for the vast interstellar cyclocastles we discussed in Interstellar Trade, and many of these red giants, subgiants, and bigger stars like Vega may have vast planetary systems and potentially orders of magnitude more raw material than most systems do. They will frequently have companion stars too, many of which might be full solar systems in their own right. Such systems make up the minority of stars by far, but may be the glowing capitals of stellar empires even around these dying stars, which may serve as the birth spot for new stellar civilizations arriving from distant Earth. Of course they are dying stars, and we will continue this series by looking at how to avoid that problem, how to mine stars, evacuate systems threatened by ones that exploded, how to prevent those explosions, how to move or kill such stars, and how civilizations might live without stars in our future episodes. So after I finished the script up for today's episode, I came up with another reason why you might aim to colonize giant stars, and that's for their military applications in terms of dominating that region of space or sterilizing the galaxy. This episode's already overly long though, and I suspect our episodes have been getting a bit too close to what YouTube's AI starts demonetizing or lowering the algorithms as violent, what with last week's episode being on blowing up the planet, and next week's being on the future of warfare and the one after that being about killing stars. So I am going to include discussion of the military advantages of giant stars in our Nebula version as an extended edition. Worries over what YouTube permits or being able to add bonus material or try out new things is why a bunch of us creators got together to found Nebula, our streaming service, and thanks to our audiences it's been growing strongly and letting a lot of YouTubers enjoy greater creative freedom, and you can see a lot of extended and original material from folks like Joe Scott, Jade from Up and Atom, Minute Physics, Real Engineering, Braincraft, Mustard, and more. We've also partnered up with CuriosityStream, the leader in educational streaming content, to bring you both CuriosityStream and Nebula for free while you're a CuriosityStream user. There's a lot of original extended content on Nebula by creators, like our own Coexistence with Alien series, and our regular episodes play there ad-free. If you like this episode, the Nebula version removes this ad entirely and replaces it with the extended version where we'll discuss the military advantages of these systems. As I've mentioned, we've been revisiting the topic of space warfare recently, and there's some great video on that topic over on Curiosity Stream, like World War A, Aliens Invade Earth, where leading scientists weigh in on the scenarios that might unfold if aliens found us and visited. Curiosity Stream has thousands of fun and educational videos, and they've partnered up with us at Nebula, our streaming award nominated streaming service, to offer Nebula's content along with their own if you sign up at the link in the episode's description. That means you will not only get Curiosity Stream and a 26% discount, but also lets you catch SFIA episodes a couple days early and without ads, and help support our show while you're doing it. Not to mention you need to see our extended version of today's episode. Again, you can get a year of both CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15, get to support the show and see our episodes early, and get all of that for less than $15 by using the link in the episode's description. As a quick side note before we get to our schedule, and on the topic of enclosing giant stars, I've often mentioned that the Dyson Dilemma of the Fermi Paradox is essentially asking why we can see any stars in the night sky, since older civilizations should have surrounded them all in Dyson spheres by now and we saw the advantages to doing that even to very big and short-lived stars today. I often joke that I wish I hadn't named it the Dyson Dilemma but that the Dark Night Sky Paradox was already taken, also known as Orpor's Paradox, which asks why we have as dark a sky as we do and haven't been incinerated by the Universe's combined sunlight yet. I've been meaning to do an episode on it forever but it kept getting put off for other projects, and I'm very glad to say my friend Jade from Up and Adam recently did an episode on it, which I'll link in this episode. Jade's one of those folks like Joe Scott, Cody Don Reader, Fraser Kane, and John Michael Godier I've known since the early days of the show and collaborated with before, on our episode on Boltzmann Brains and the Anthropic Principle, and if you haven't already seen her work, I'm sure you'll love it. 
So that will wrap up our episodes for the month, but we will still have our livestream Q&A this Sunday, February 28th at 4pm Eastern Time, for you to get your questions answered live. Then we'll leap into March to continue our look at the future of combat with The Next Century of War, followed by the sequels to today's episodes, Killing Stars on March 11th and Exostellar Civilizations on Sunday, March 14th. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to help support future episodes, you can donate to us on Patreon or our website, IsaacArthur.net, which I'll link in the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. You can also follow us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify to get our audio-only versions of the show. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week. <laughs>